Hi, folks. My name is Steve Wexler. I'm the founder and principal of Data Revelations. I am one of the three authors of the Big Book of Dashboards and uh, author of an upcoming book called The Big Picture. Delighted to be here for, as it's not church chat, it's not chit chat, it is chart chat. And um, uh, joining me today is the um, new uh, Executive Director of the D Data Visualization Society. Please meet Amanda McCulloch. Hi, guys. Should I be introducing myself further? Uh, I'm, based, well, I'm based, in, based in Washington, D.C. I also work for Excella as the Data Visualization Lead. Excited to be here today and excited to be talking about all things charts with my three co-hosts. I think Andy can hear us. He can! I can hear Excellent. you. Can you hear me? <laughs> we can. I don't actually know what happened there. So uh, I assume you have all brilliantly introduced everybody. The thing I was Jeff has not gone yet. Yeah. Jeff Schaefer, right, go, Jeff. Uh, Chief Operating Officer at Unifund in Cincinnati, Ohio, where it feels like Wisconsin today with snow and cold, and uh, also adjunct professor at the University of Cincinnati, where we've been virtual for a year. So still doing that. Crazy times. All right. And I'm Andy Cotgreave, Technical Evangelist at Tableau. If you enjoyed the song, uh, I don't know how popular that song was in the US. That was Pie by Kate Bush. And I'm sure the uh, very observant among you will have noticed that she didn't actually correctly list the digits of Pi. Uh, she skipped digit 78 to 101. I'm sure you will notice that. Uh, there you go. That's today's pop trivia. Anyway, this is Chart Chat. Uh, we are going to go for about an hour with some, uh, I don't know, potentially heated debate, uh, if not heated, at least active and exciting. Uh, we want you to join in the conversation. In the first hour, please type in your questions uh, in chat. We love hearing your opinions and try to incorporate those into the conversation as we go. We will, of course, be holding the legendary after party. Uh, after this section of the webinar ends, we will be going to another Zoom, bigpick.me slash cc18 after, and we will share this URL multiple times, where the four of us stay quiet for half an hour and you can, we open the mic so that you can all tell us your opinions on what we're about to um, be talking about. And these have been really, uh, you know, fantastic for us to get a chance to hear everybody's opinions and bring you all on board. Before we get going with the agenda, just wanted to mention that uh, Outlier is happening next week. That is the Conference of the Data Visualization Society, which if you haven't heard of, uh, you should get involved in. Outlier is going to be an amazing conference. Uh, and uh, while we're here, we should definitely say a very warm congratulations to co-host Amanda, who has become... What is your title now, Amanda? I'm, I have, I'm now the executive director for the Data Visualization Society for the next two years. So very excited that, about that. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. You are going to be superb at that job and look forward to seeing how you take uh, the DVS forward. Do you want to say anything about Outlier? Or, um... I'll, I'll just quickly plug that it is a conference spanning three days with 20 hours of content each day. We doubt anyone will go to a full 20 hours live each day, but wanted to be inclusive to having speakers from around the world delivering their talks and Q&As from their time zones as well as making it a globally inclusive event. Uh, the tickets are available online. There is a sliding scale for tickets. So hopefully anybody can find a ticket price that works for them. We don't want price to be a barrier to anyone attending. And if you do sign up to attend, we are still actively looking for uh, speakers and facilitators for our unconference sessions that are programmed in throughout the day to create more interactive opportunities to do AMAs and roundtables and have really friendly conversations with other outlier attendees. So if you have any questions, feel free to ping me in the chat. I'll put a link in the chat to where you can find tickets, speaker lists, and more. Um, and I will shout out to Steve, who is one of our speakers, actually. I'm excited mm -hmm. to hear his talk all about the ways in which we can all create that kind of organizational change with data in our organizations. And what was the stat, Amanda, on new speakers, people who have not um, yeah, we have we have twenty percent of the speakers who we have speaking have never done a conference talk before, but had really impressive, amazing stories to share and work to share. So we've got twenty percent of folks who are from who are new to speaking at conferences, and I can throw a link in the chat that includes additional diversity statistics around our speaker selection process and who got selected. And I'm really proud of the lineup that we've been able to put together in terms of all the different perspectives and experiences that we're bringing to the table. 
Yeah, it, it the lineup looks really good. Uh, yeah, very innovative lineup. So I'm excited to be attending next week. Uh, also, Galen Smith, I saw in chat, said he is speaking too. So another great speaker. Okay, what are we talking about today? Our agenda is this. We're going to talk about Sankey and proportion charts, uh, difficult concepts with unit charts. And if we get to the lightning round, we've got um, unemployment charts, screaming cats, scaredy cats, and turds. Which we, as a group, we're not sure we're going to get that far because we think we've got a lot to talk about. But if you if we don't get to explaining what turds are, you'll have to tune in next month. Um, each of these sections is based on data viz we've seen in the wild in the last or since the last episode of If Data Could Talk. So with that, our first person to take the debating mace is Steve Wexler with Sankey and proportion charts. Or Steve or and. And I am going to, uh, I am going to, what is the word that they use during the uh, 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 discussions and the debate around impeachment? I am going to defer to Jeffrey Schaefer on this. Oh my um, God. <laughs> you know, I've been, in, I've been in two days of training sessions and clearly uh, hosting coming off a training session is difficult. Hey, hey and, and, and folks out there, hey, it's not like this doesn't happen in your Zoom meetings, okay? Come on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just showing you how it can happen to all of us. Jeff, take it away. Yes, yes. Well, um, first, I guess, just to, to talk a little bit about where this is coming from, um, and, I, and I should ask everybody can see my screen. Is, is that up for you? Looks great. Um, Stephanie Evergreen uh, posted a, uh, a post uh, 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 last week or a few days back um, entitled Proportion Charts. And, and that's, that's really where this topic is gonna come from. Um, and I'll say related to sand keys um, in some form or fashion. And I'm gonna save the discussion of, you know, the definitions of these things, I guess, for a different day, just to, to let you know, you know, that we talk about sand key diagrams um, more in a broader sense, it, it might be more accurate to say alluvial diagrams. There's a lot of, uh, if you Google this, you can find topics of this and, and people will agree or disagree on this topic. And um, we'll save that debate for maybe another time. You know, is there a difference between an alluvial diagram and a sand key diagram? You know, sand, some people will say a sand key diagram is really about a flow of something through a system. An alluvial diagram would be more of you know, a category compared to another category. Um, all of these things are, are kind of, they look similar and, and maybe, maybe describing similar things. Um, but the topic for today really had to do with a variation on this um, that Stephanie calls a, a proportion plot. And I'm gonna come back to this proportion plot in, in a minute. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the plot, um, about what it's showing and, and why it, maybe it's different than a sand key diagram. Really what the, the, the purpose of a proportion plot is taking a population on one side and comparing it to a subset of that population on the other side. And the chart that she referenced in her blog where this um, comes from is the statistic Lee chart. And this chart is looking at the population of the U.S. on the bottom. So there's there's 60 percent uh, population that is white in the United States, and then it's taking that share of deaths as a subpopulation up top. Now, before we dive into whether this is a good you know visual way to show this comparison, I want to talk a little bit about the numbers. And and this comes I don't know who the creator of this chart is. Um, other than I know it came from statistic.ly. Uh, it was referenced in Stephanie's post, but I do wanna talk about the, the math on this num these numbers a little bit, just because what it says at the top is per million. So I just want everybody to understand in this particular case, this isn't really a proportion showing against the population. This is a rate, it's a share of deaths per million. And what that means then is that there's a number of deaths per million. They've, they've normalized the population. And so this is a little bit deceiving. This was on Reddit and there were literally a thousand comments to this particular graph on Reddit that it was confusing and deceitful and so on and so forth and got some attention on Twitter. In fact, I think the original post was probably taken down, but it's still out there on, on Reddit. 
The problem is, is on the left side of this, and I'm, I'm using Stephanie's amazing template in Excel. It's super easy to use. It took me literally like a minute to create this. And, and um, this is the original based on this person's data. The problem is, is that that really isn't the share of police deaths on the left-hand side. The share of police deaths actually looks like this. Now it's still disproportional in, in, in very much. It's the rate of, of black uh, police shooting killings um, is twice the rate of other uh, races, um, but not as disproportional as say the, this one is. And so what we're really viewing um, is something that's out of context, I guess, a little bit, because on the left-hand side, it's actually showing the percent of the rate. Now, that's a really kind of complex calculation that this person chose to do. If you say, oh, Black people are killed at 34 per million, while white people are killed at 14 per million, then that percentage comes from taking 34 divided by whatever that is, 78 and then 25 divided by 78 and 14 divided by 78. That is not uh, the actual percentage of the shootings. That would be as if you normalize the population, meaning if there were 1 million black people, 1 million Hispanic people, 1 million white people, and they were all killed at the rate that they're being killed, this is what the proportion would be. Now, back to the chart itself, I think this chart could be useful if used in the right way, it's taking a proportion of an overall population and then you're comparing it to a sub portion of that population. Imagine 327 million people in the total population here. There is some really, really tiny percent, 0.0016% that are involved in killing by police officers, but that's 5,400 people. Then you want to look at the percentage of those 5,392 people. That's what you see over on the right-hand side, breaking off into this subpopulation. So this is a, an interesting way. And I think the proportion chart, that the template that Stephanie created, is an interesting way to view that, that data. Um, I did, redid the colors. I added in here just a couple things. I, I fixed this person, whoever statistic.ly. I, I corrected, if you will, the percentages to match the share of deaths on the right-hand side. I added the totals of the population at the top. And then I put in the rate at which it's happening because I think that's probably the story here. The rate at which something is happening is happening at a much higher rate to one class of people versus a, a, a different uh, race of people. Um, so that, that's uh, really what I did here in this. This is the same thing. Somebody else did this long before I did. They posted on Twitter and said, here's the chart redone in this format with the data presented in a way that is accurate rather than deceitful. So somebody took statistically's data. Um, the data comes from the Washington Post, by the way. Somebody redid it, basically the same percentages that I did and showing um, the, same, the same thing. Where I think this has value, and I, I think going back to the chart, this is where I think it's an interesting view of the data. I just took the two distributions here and I kind of want to show you another way, a different way that the Washington Post viewed this data. Again, the bottom set of bars is your total population. The top set of bars in this instance is the, the police shootings. Again, it's really a rate of police shootings. It's not the proportion of them, right? So what we're going to do is rotate the rate at which the shootings are happening. Forget the percentages. I'm gonna put it on top of the bars. Then I'm going to increase the width of the bar to equal the population of the US. And that's where we get this chart that has the rate on one axis and the population on the other axis. And that is exactly how the Washington Post visualized this data. Rather than showing a percent of the subpopulation, they focused on the rate at which people were getting killed. And in this example here, you'll see that at, at one rate, we have 34, much higher rate per person uh, per million um, versus uh, another, another class, right? Another uh, race um, like white. 
I think that works a whole lot better than trying to make a comparison like this. And so I, I think there really is a value in these charts, uh, the proportion chart, you know, try to make a proportion comparison of the stacked bar on the left compared to the pie chart on the right. This is where Stephanie's template, I think, does a really good job of making a better comparison of these two things side by side. It's using a really a stacked bar on each side, and it's using this sand key looking thing you know in between it and so that's where i think it it has value when you're trying to show the rate and a number of something this is another way of doing it we've seen this we've actually talked about a chart similar to this in a previous chart chat where you have the size of something um but it's happening at a different rate um so i think that this chart here um, this is a, a different version, a uh, different population, but I, I think it really does have some value in showing uh, the proportion of, of two populations. So with that, I'll uh, open it up to my cohorts here. What do you think? Thanks, Jeff. Who, who wants to go? Go, Amanda. Uh, so I, I, I've been looking at this and looking at some of the other examples that have popped up because anytime there's a new easy to use Excel template. I feel like people jump on that opportunity to play with that and see exactly the construction that goes in to kind of make that work in Excel. It's always a fun game to play. Uh, I think there, are, there were two things that struck me about this when I saw it. One is oftentimes I've, I've worked with a lot of nonprofits and worked a lot with global health data, worked a lot with uh, populations that have relatively low data visualization literacy. And I think that what's nice about this is that when you look at it and you read it, it is something that looks a bit novel, but familiar. I mean, it's functionally kind of is a stacked area chart with only two endpoints. And it also just makes me think a lot of the ways in which we try to draw people into with visualization. So if I gave you the same information as a paired bar chart, it wouldn't draw you in as much as something that has this kind of shape and has this kind of visual weight. So I feel like this has more visual weight and takes up more space if you put it into a report or somewhere else. So I can see it working really well, especially in presentations or other spaces. The one thing that struck me when I was initially reading it is I felt like I was reading something over time because I have such a natural association with there being an X axis of time on area charts or on line charts. And so that was the one thing I had to kind of adjust in my mental model looking at these. But I think there's certainly space for these kind of more different interpretations and reimagining of different charts in different ways. And I think the more we have a shared language to talk about them, the more we can have these kind of conversations. And so I appreciate when these kind of ideas are put out there in the database community to talk about and have conversations about. Thanks, Amanda. Um, Kevin Fleurlidge has made a comment and Steve, you've agreed. Do you wanna take that on? The, so the two different issues that I wanna take on. One is a little concern about possibly amplifying misinformation and making sure that doesn't happen. I'm gonna go to that second. And, um, but first I'll tackle, uh, should you use this chart? And Andy, I'm gonna quote you, well, it depends. I'm skeptical about um, people being able to understand what's happening on this quickly. And so um, is the goal time to insight and ease of insight for the audience? Or are you trying to have some type of uh, evoke some type of feeling or emotional response to something. So you do, you do need to know your audience and what the position is. Maybe this is absolutely the right way to show this data. But trying to compare this floating thing that's on the left, not from a common baseline to a floating thing on the right, it's the making accurate comparisons will be very difficult with this. And I probably should have put in a one one hundredth of the effort that Jeff did. And I said, well, let me just do this as a connected dot plot or a, uh, a gap chart and see if it's easier. And well, I know it's going to be easier. The question is, is it going to have the emotional wallop that you want it to have? So first and foremost, I'm always a believer on time to insight or gleaning insight. And the second is, well, how am I going to persuade somebody? Realize, you know, if this were the mid, you know, 19th century, I'd be telling, um, you know, Florence Nightingale, what is this coxcomb wedge chart nonsense? Come on, there's a much easier way to show this. And, and, and this woman actually absolutely knew her audience and why that would be the right thing to go with. So if you know your audience, the other concern I have is um, continuing to use that first data set. So in the much larger gap than is actually correct in, in the template, is Stephanie continuing to show that 
um, on the website as an example, because I think it's inadvertently amplifying misinformation. And the concern that I have with this is the same concern that Jeff and I had, gosh, it's now four years ago, over the uh, gender pay gap in Australia, where people were saying, oh my God, it's 250%. It's just ridiculous. And it, and it wasn't 250%. It's like 20, 25% difference. And then people are numb to it. They go, oh, that doesn't sound like it's such a big deal. This is a huge deal here. But if you thought it was the thing on the left and then you see it on the thing on the right, you may think, oh, it's not quite as pronounced as we had thought it was before. So I hate to see people inadvertently amplifying something that's not correct or is not based on sound analysis. Very good. That was um, uh, 2017, uh, I believe. That, is that, that's right. Read you. Okay, yep. That was welcome, Eva, to uh, <laughs> <laughs> first to, to, to make over Monday. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, I I've got a bunch of comments. Oh, no, I I I, th I think you're right, Steve. We we should always endeavour to not perpetuate uh, mistakes. Um, I think the counter from Eva and the team at the time was, how much time should one always applied to the data you're looking at and some you know the answer was sometimes we don't, we're going to take the data set at face value making an assumption it's correct and those argument the argument against that has been made well um so jeff while you're on that slide um i i think the the, the to me the the comment about the problem with stack charts is absolutely right you know hispanic it's really difficult for me to actually see whether hispanic grew or shrank uh, without looking at the numbers on the left or the right. Uh, I mean, I can just about make it out. But this goes back again to this. It's like, what's the primary and the secondary set of information you can convey in a chart? The pri in, in this case, the primary is look at the left, look at the right. You can see a proportion of each each member of each category. And then secondarily, you might be able to see whether one category is grown or not. So you're always making that compromise with every visualization you make. Um, uh, Amanda, you said the timepiece. I, I actually wonder whether rotating the chart solves the timepiece problem. So, Jeff, can you go to the? Oh, sorry, the, um, the rotated version. I, I wonder, does that solve the problem or, or create different ones? Would you? Would you? I mean, I think it, it helps in terms of not having that kind of feeling of an intuitive flow that there is some kind of flow from left to right over time. I do think mm. one of the things that if you go back up with your other one, Jeff, that you would recolor. I thought a couple there and thinking about the aligned scale question um, and thinking about kind of, uh, if we go back to the orange one, um, if you think about the aligned scale question, when we were reading a chart and starting at the top to the bottom, reading and seeing the category for black first, if that's the area of focus, makes sense. Would there be any logic or rationale to splitting those two categories of interest out and putting one along the bottom mm. and one along the top if you're arbitrary the categories? I'm not sure if they are. Um, I think they're stacked based on a number at this point. But as you, we kind of look yeah. at this moving this way, I, I do think this helps some in terms of the readability and looking at it categorically. Yeah, I think it definitely stopped the time um, as, as well. I, I um, David, David, uh, oh, good looking name. David wrote an interesting thing saying that the width or the height in this case. I think what's interesting, if you look back at this one, I think the two questions I would ask here are, I, I think the ordering on the categorical axes are interesting and good. And I think that it uh, is more intuitive of reading categories from left to right. Looking at this one, if I was interested in actually having an aligned scale for black and Hispanic, would there be a rationale for putting those on the top and the bottom? So you have kind of an aligned scale of sorts for both. You have a straight line on one side of that shape. Um, but the other thing I think that's, that's helpful here is that there's actually kind of a key call out or a key takeaway at the top that says, here's what I want you to see from this chart. I think regardless of which layout you choose, there are other decisions and choices made here, like giving a clear specific takeaway of what you want someone to read that can help someone interpret and understand it. Are we going to dive into those Mecco comments, Andy? I have feelings. About yeah, I uh, well, I, I my 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 diving in was to say there's a fair debate about Mayor and Mecco, the Mecco example. <laughs> uh, I wanted to, to if you go to the Mecco that the Washington Post did, but actually my my the challenge I always have with Mecco charts is does area mean anything here, or is it just the, 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 we're just encoding data by length and height, 
It it does How mean something actually out. here because it um it, it if you think about the x axis that's 42 million people wide, right? And the y axis is 34 people tall. So you actually can convert that bar into a unit bar is there's 42 million people, there's 42 segments across the bottom and there's 34 segments going up and so there'd be 34 times 42 dots. Right. That's how many people would be killed. And then in the longer, um, you'd have 197 dots going across the white population. You'd only have 14 going up. And so you have more people killed, um, pure numbers, right? Twice as many yep. pure numbers killed, but at a much lower rate for the population. Interesting. And I see, thank you. And I see, you know, the, the, the challenge with these charts is you've got people, Neil Richards in the comments is saying, uh, the Marimako wins for him. Uh, Amanda saying you find a lot of people find them confusing, and it's really it's. I, I do you want to add some flavor to that, Amanda? Because it is a really. I, I mean, I've uh, this, this to me like I, I like I am a data viz person, and I I like them. I understand them, but I don't find them very intuitive to read. Even though I understand how to read them, that's my personal takeaway. And I don't understand kind of how I'm supposed to read this. Is the tall. Is the, the, ideally, I guess here, I have some kind of explanation saying a taller, narrower bar means things are worse for that group than a wider, shorter, or just generally shorter bar. Like, which of these do I care about? And the thing I care about is the height the most, and I should be the most concerned by the height, and especially when the height is tall for a very narrow segment. But I have to think through that in a way that I actually feel like I don't as much with her proportion chart or some of the other options, a dumbbell plot, some other way of encoding that information. And when I've shown MECO charts in workshops with different audiences who are, uh, have spent less time working with data and building charts and graphs, these do not seem to sell well in terms of being very easy to understand. And you so think I, make I, a I, difference tend, I tend to, to think the question if, is, how do people it, understand them and read them? Do you, do you think it would make a difference to you if they were broken up into units of, you know, this was just, uh, you know, basically a sized waffle chart and you could see the 1,426 people? I think it helps some with uh, enforcing the unit. Um, I think the more important thing is that kind of which axis do I care about that's causing the alarm or the concern and having some clear information there. And the color gives a hint there too, but maybe. Mm, interesting. Um, I see uh, somebody called themselves Mike, Microsoft Excel Calc so it says simple beats sexy, which is funnily enough what I told my wife when I was wooing her. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> we'll not go any further than that. And uh, apologies if that would offend you. Uh, uh, then Julia Marillo, I've lost your name, is it? Uh, is talking about the power of slow reveals on the curve charts, uh, the proportional charts. I think, you know, if you were presenting this, it, it would be really interesting to, to, if you go back a slide, Jeff, to show one of the curved versions, um, to, sh to sort of start on the, just show the left hand side and then slowly wipe away to reveal the transition to the right hand side, I think that would add um, a bit more drama and anticipation to the to the proportional check differences between the two. Uh, sides. Yeah, and again, I'll put another shout out to Stephanie. Um, well, first off, everything at the top that you said, Amanda, was descriptive about the chart. You know that that was all her work, and her template makes it easy to do that reveal because you could. You could show slide, you know, slide one and just show the, the top one and you could do one at a time. You could easily, you know, reveal this one by one because uh, the way it's built in the Excel template, it would be easy to do that. Right. Great. Hey, Steve. one other thing. I, I want to talk about people who are just refusing to budge on certain things. You know, Jeff, you mentioned that there was a lot of a thousand comments and people pointing out the shortcomings of the analysis and some people going, no, I'm just going to stick with this. And I, I wish we were all a little bit better when somebody points out a flaw or a shortcoming going, oh my gosh, you're right. Let me, let, let, let me fix this or address it. You know, certainly I've made mistakes. I, I, I'll, I'll retweet something and I've got to be careful about that. The bigger amplifier, the bigger, the, the greater concern you have to have with retweeting. I remember when Trump retweeted something that was outrageous. And he said, oh, well, you know, I didn't write it. I didn't say it. I just retweeted it. Oh, my gosh. You see, you're, people are following you. But I, I might have made the same mistake in thinking, oh, this is good data. You know, it's been somebody else 
that I trust vetted this. I'm not going to look into this. I'm going to use that first data set where the, the proportions are, or the first analysis comparing things that I shouldn't be comparing. And the minute somebody points out, that's not how you should be comparing this. It's, oh my gosh, I'm trying to create a large amplifier. I'm supposed to be a trustworthy website or a trustworthy Twitter presence here. I just promoted something which is nonsense. I've got to fix this. I've got to atone for it. And it drives me nuts when people go, no, I'm, I'm just going to stick to my guns or double down with this type of stuff. Um, yeah, I guess I, I spent a bunch of time with this data now, so I can I can chime in and say the, the math is correct. You know, this person did the math correct, um, whoever whoever it is. Um, but even if, even if the comparison, I don't think the comparison is a good comparison because we're comparing rate on the top normalized to um, the population at the bottom. But even if it were the right comparison, clearly the thousand comments on Reddit were confused. And, and I, I shared this with you, Steve. It reminded me of a viz that Bo McCready did um, on his film genre popularity. And this was on, he put this on Reddit and there were hundreds, maybe thousand comments on it about how people were thought this was deceiving because the access is, is different across um, the Y axis is different for the, the different genres. So you can't really make this comparison. And, you know, he responded, he created this button at the top that will allow you to standardize the access range. And when you click it, it, it standardizes everything. And now you can make a, a comparison of the height of one area to the other. But then if you want to see the trend of sci-fi, you can't see it on this chart. So you click this one and now you can go back and you can actually see the trend for, for sci-fi. So I, I think there are things that we could, you know, uh, to your point, Steve, uh, take that feedback loop and, and bring it back into the visualization. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Yeah, I shut, I, shut up a whole bunch of people with one button. <laughs> <laughs> Which Bernie, well, you probably, could... I know you'd like to do that with me, uh, Andy. <laughs> so uh... I, I can actually, I'm a host, so I could, <laughs> but, but I would never dream of doing such a thing. Uh, so um, everybody, we are about to move on, but don't forget after party, if you have opinions, we hope you do stick around for the after party at the end of the hour or after the end of the hour. Okay. Um, now let's see if I can get the person right this time. Let's see if I can get one thing right. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about difficult concepts and unit charts. And I reckon this one is Amanda. I love my unit charts, I do. All right, so uh, I think we've still got the, the subtitles actually running on this. Should we turn the subtitles off or give the PowerPoint subtitles wow. a go? Uh, so I wanted to talk today a little bit about explaining concept, complex concepts with unit charts and talk about where and why I started thinking about this. And in the context actually of seeing a couple graphs and charts popping up, if you don't know me or haven't talked to me before, um, I have a background in public health and global health and have worked in data viz for a long time in that space. And so the past year has been an interesting and wild ride in data visualization of COVID-19. Um, so as we look at these two different charts side by side, on the left is cumulative COVID-19 vaccination doses administered per 100 people. And on the right is a chart published by The Guardian that had percentage of people vaccinated. And I saw this pop up in this Guardian article, which was overall a good, interesting article. I was like, wow, I hadn't really seen many places that were reporting national coverage data yet. And so I went back to our world and data and lo and behold, they don't have that. They have cumulative COVID-19 vaccination doses administered per 100 people, which is not the same as percent of people vaccinated. And so it raised a question to me about how was it that we actually learned to go ahead and understand and interpret these new measures and metrics that may feel old hat to public health professionals, but at the same time may be brand new to others. And these numbers are basically the same if you compare the numbers on these charts and the axes are on the same scale. So um, it made me realize that maybe there might be some of the same confusion about some of these new vaccination metrics as we start having new data come out about doses, about supply and about coverage. And as I was thinking about the ways in which we've learned these concepts before for other things, uh, this test positivity uh, article from COVID tracking project popped up in my head, which I thought was a great way of using a really simple set of small visualizations to go ahead and actually explain a complicated topic to actually take the kind of math behind the actual metric and break it down in some way, shape or form. 
So you're looking here at this illustrative population and looking at a group of people who have been tested and then getting to see what share received a positive test result and eventually being able to then dig and dive into why this actually may be a bit misleading because this is only a sample of the larger population. And they continue to break this down through this series of unit charts that as you scroll down the page, you get to interact with. I thought it was a really effective way of using visualization as a tool to teach the math behind a number. And whether that's something we do with things that we're all consuming through data journalism or something we're doing even with our clients or stakeholders, I found this to be a really well done article. Um, as we look at this, they've used little circles or little dots that actually are done with color only as their primary way of encoding that information. Um, and then, like I said, shown how that works across the population. If we actually dive into another example, Scientific American, one of my chart chat co-hosts flagged this one for me, talked about test specificity um, and sensitivity, which is another complicated epidemiology topic to understand. And Scientific American went ahead and they actually did their own explainer of this. But as you scroll through this graphic, you can see that they have various different ways of showing these four different states of being in terms of actually positive, actually negative, false negatives, and false positives. And scrolling through this, they've used both color and these little Xs on the circles to provide additional levels of visual encoding to explain this math behind this concept. And continuing to see these pop up, I think they're great. I really like them a lot. And I thought, well, is that a way we could help to better explain some of just even the simpler math behind vaccination coverage and why it might get more complicated over time? So if we look at the uh, question I asked Twitter a couple days ago, I asked people to do some vaccine math without any graphics. Um, I asked and said, if we gave out 36 COVID vaccine doses administered in a community of 100 people with four only receiving the first of two required doses and 32 doses given to people who received two doses each, what share of the community is fully vaccinated? Uh, and so we asked Twitter, about two thirds of people got it right in terms of the context and information here. I'd love to know more about the we don't knows. Um, the hint here in this question was two required doses, saying it's a two dose regimen and that's how many you need to be fully vaccinated. And so if you take the 32 doses to those who receive two doses each and divide it by two, you get to that 16% of the population. But talking that through and saying it out loud and writing it in words isn't nearly as effective, I think, as actually breaking it down with these kind of unit charts. So if we look at an illustrative population of 100 people who are not vaccinated against COVID and 20 received the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, and then 16 of those people received the second dose, that gives us a quick visual in terms of what this looks like in terms of who's been vaccinated within a population. And Steve and I tinkered and played around a lot with what kind of shapes or colors do you, you use to represent this kind of information? Steve, you wanna say a little bit about that? <laughs> Just, just that the, the the collaboration and iterating on this thing, you know, Jeff, Andy, and I have talked about this for years. I was steadfastly, you know, you showed me a version where two totally different colors. I was mm -hmm. absolutely convinced in my head. I said, oh, no, let's do this or um, try totally empty circles, uh, half filled circles, and then all filled circles to show, oh, you've only got one of the two doses and it didn't work. You know, and then, you know, it, 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 and I was sure, oh, this is going to be great. And then, oh, my God, it's really hard to follow. No, rectangles, not circles. Try it with rectangles. No, a lot, and it didn't work at all. And then it was, oh, just do different, you know, different saturation of the same color. Um, and, and it kind of pops out. Which is much more intuitive on like partially versus completely, I feel like. And putting the, sh the same color around the outside of the circle and things helps a bunch. So as we kind of needled through this and talked about it, I think the key thing here is that we can look at this kind of graphic and this kind of explainer, and we can think about some basic vaccination metrics. I spent a couple of years working specifically with um, routine immunization data. So um, if we look at cumulative doses administered, these are the numbers you're seeing on most of those trackers that just keep going up, 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 are on cumulative doses administered or per 100 people in a population. Um, we know that we had 36 doses administered but doses are not the same as people, right? So how many people received at least one dose of the vaccine? So that's our 20, right? Our 20 people or 20 dots at the top got at least one dose. Then what percent of the population is fully immunized? And so there you get down to that 16 or that 16% and being able to look at that number. 
And there's a reason that this really matters, looking at um, comparing doses and the numbers about doses to looking at people. And people matter in part because the reason we keep tracking this so closely and the reason I feel like vaccine coverage is going to be the most watched measure of 2021 right now is because what we're doing is trying to estimate our progress towards herd immunity. And this is not taking into account those who have had COVID and have some natural immunity from having had the infection. But if we put a threshold, so thresholds have been suggested between 75 to 90 or 95 percent, but 75 percent coverage or 75 percent coverage needed for herd immunity, we really want to see progress up towards filling those little gray circles. Those are the people we need to get vaccinated to get to that herd immunity number. If we have a higher threshold, we need to get to more people getting vaccinated. And so as you're watching a lot of these charts, I think the added thing here is why does this number matter? And what benchmark are we comparing it against? Because the reality is we'll never get to 100% vaccination coverage. That's not gonna happen with COVID. It doesn't happen with most vaccines. And so instead thinking about how we're actually moving towards some kind of threshold. And that's why these coverage numbers matter so much and will get increasingly complex as we have to start to track more granularly, did you get a two dose or a one dose vaccine? So suddenly fully covered for a J and J vaccine would be a single dose. And so how we count people and how we convert doses over into people becomes more and more complex and requires more and more granular data. So we talked about three different examples of unit charts. I would love to know from my co-hosts, what do you think about unit charts to explain math and concepts? Have you seen other good ways we can teach and explain math and concepts? I, I, I think they're fantastic. Um, I, I have a question. If you go back a couple of slides to the uh, that one, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, what percentage of the pop population is vaccinated? So it depends on how you define vaccinated. <laughs> right, and, 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 there, and here's the thing, because I think what's really, what, what, the way you've presented it, you, you've said is fully immunized, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think that, that, that's a new problem. Fully vaccinated, you could use as a sub there, yeah. Yeah, but it's because I, I wonder if fully Im fully immunized is a phrase you're familiar with because of your background. Mm -hmm. But the media, the media never uses fully immunized; they just use nope. vaccinated. And uh, I think this is, you know, the, this, this is the challenge. You, you know, it could be sixteen percent of vaccinated or twenty percent of vaccinated, depending on who's 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 trying to um, make the point. In the well, UK, and, what, and the, the complicating the thing there too is that you look at the uh, is actually just getting everyone one dose a bigger priority if we had better efficacy data that one dose was more was something that we could allow and get broader single dose protection, even if it's not that 95% efficacy that we're getting from two doses. The challenge is we just don't have good data on that. So it's not as feasible to recommend that as a policy position, but you've seen the UK, the US talking about with a limited supply, should our priority be getting more people one dose and then delaying the follow-up or not? And this is why vaccine metrics get complicated. Denominators get complicated. How you're actually quantifying the population, especially in countries that don't have good civil um, events and vital statistics registries or census data. Uh, so there's, a, there, there's an article coming out of Nightingale on Monday that unpacks eight additional constraints and concerns around looking at and interpreting vaccination data. That, so that, I won't go in that great. too far. <laughs> right, I, that's great. I also add uh, the Home Office in the UK, the government are using, they're claiming they will have, well, the, the the claim is getting reported as like all all um, vulnerable groups will be vaccinated by mid February. The reality of the number they're choosing is actually vaccines offered to everybody over a certain age. And I'm like, vaccines offered is a very different number, but that just slight inaccuracy in their number, and then you go to a media that takes the easiest interpretation is highly potentially deceptive. Um, interesting. Okay, Stephen Jeff, any anything to add? I, I really like the uh, unit charts. And uh, one advantage I found with something like this is when you have really small percentages of something um, and you're showing it as a as 100%, you know, trying to show anything, you start getting less than 10%, 5% of 100 or 3% of 100, your bar charts are not going to be useful at all. You're not going to see the bar on the, the access. So when you're making um, comparisons like that, I think especially with small populations of a total, um, I, I find them really useful. Uh, Steve, before I come to you, I'll just say, uh, Randy, uh, I'm guessing that's Randy Crum, I can't see full name. Randy's saying he likes how, the, how they work, but some, 
often we see when one dot represents 10,000 people, for example, uh, just the interpretation of the audience can get a bit confused. Um, the Microsoft Excel recalc user uh, it also it emphasizes they're very human-like. You know, it's, it's like that dot represents me, right? You know, I am one of those dots, be it red or gray. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, Steve, did you have anything to add? Uh, very little. Just you know, when you have the J and J, um, the single dose there, and you may have ordered, um, uh, you know, I know we've discussed it. Instead of saying one dose versus two doses, <laughs> this becomes partially vaccinated versus fully vaccinated. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I would ask the question: Should we be learning that language now <laughs> instead of waiting? What happens if a three dose comes out that you need a Moderna b a booster to be fully vaccinated? South African wow. variant. Yes, exactly. So uh, yeah. fair point. I think I really like that the one that's in the, the the top on the left there i think this is just abundantly clear of, yep. of the math problem that you posed on twitter all right and great uh mike hollander asks is there a unit chart template somewhere um assuming well if you're using tableau if you google units chart template templates do exist there are easy and harder ways to build uh, unit charts in Tableau, and I'm sure sh I'm sure solutions exist for other platforms too. Well, look at that. We got through that. We have not yet come to blows. This is amazing. We've got 12 minutes left, so I think in our lightning round, we're going to start off with unemployment charts. Uh, and I think that was Jeff. Lightning round. All right. The unemployment... Um job numbers came out earlier January and the news articles were fantastic. Um, 140,000 jobs were cut in December. Women accounted for all of them. Um, so every woman, was anybody who was fired was just a woman and, and, the, and nobody who was fired was a man. Well, of course, that's not right. Um, you know, some men lost jobs, more men gained jobs, more women lost jobs. Um, but some of the headlines were, were, were pretty funny. Uh, and that caught some attention of people who then dove into the data to try to explain that there's gives and takes. There are women that gain jobs and there were women that lost jobs. Um, one of the better examples was um, Mona, uh, who uh, we've talked about before, had some, she does these brilliant illustrations and, and wonderful things. She took a deeper look into this. And um, in this example, kind of went step by step through this and said, okay, in December, uh, employers cut 140,000 jobs. Keep in mind, this is just an absolute number of jobs. That's how they report it. She says, this is a very misleading number. Um, in reality, there were 16,000 extra jobs for men. So the men went up at 156,000 fewer for women. Again, just as an absolute number, that's also potentially misleading. She broke it down further to show the difference between white women Hispanic women and black women and showed that the white women were actually gaining jobs and it was where Hispanic women and black women were, were losing jobs. Um, my only comment to these things is that we just have to be careful with taking numbers um, just out of context just by themselves. I know that it is common in the news reports where they just report this number of unemployed people, um, but there's a bunch of things you got to think about in here. These are the number of employed, um, and I'm just going to focus on the women because that's that's what Mona did. But there are a lot less women, um, black women that are are working than than white women. If we look at the number, which is what Mona was doing, 82,000 black women less, uh, fewer um, jobs for black women, where the white women were increasing. That's all fine and that number is correct and that's exactly what the BLS was reporting. Um, but we also have to think about the labor force. There were 154,000 black women that left the labor force. You could argue maybe they gave up looking for a job but they might've just retired too. There were more white women joining the labor force. So another way to look at this data might just be to say, okay, well, the participation rate of the black women of that age group went down, the participation rate went up. Um, and so basically that creates less unemployment. That means that black women while losing jobs, actually the unemployment rate came down because more of them left the workforce faster. 
Now, you can make arguments of these numbers one way or the other. Again, maybe they gave up and stopped looking for work. Um, looking at people who are 65 and older, you know, we have the baby boomer population that's retiring very quickly. So how fast are they leaving the workforce? Um, but I think just looking at the CNN number of 144,000 people lost their job and they were all women. Um, that's a that's a that's a kind of a deceitful uh, headline, I think. Excellent. Well, it was, Thank you, it was Jeff. Striking that the rest of the, uh, the oftentimes the headlines shouldn't talk about some of the actual breakdowns around job loss by a demographic group, which I think Mona was trying to point to more so, and and I think those are good things to point to. I appreciate your digging into the data and the numbers a bit more because I will admit I do not spend a lot of time with BLS statistics in terms of understanding and knowing how they're interpreted and used, and so it's helpful to see those other ones to put these kind of numbers in context. I found that the the net piece of this was what seemed to be confusing to folks in terms of your opening statement that it was not that um, women lost all jobs and men gained all jobs. It's a net number across the losses and the gains. Thanks, Amanda. Um, the BLS data is quite good. I've downloaded it a few times. It's actually a good data set to download and take a look at. Did you find that, Jeff? I do. There's just interpretations of that. You know, people will, mm -hmm. the unemployment rate, for example, you know, it's calculated by, you know, unemployed versus that labor force. And if people um, in, in trying economic times or pandemic, people may give up and not, not be in the labor force. So there's some argument to be made that it's, you know, maybe not a true statistic or it's not, um, not the perfect statistic, I guess, but what is. Yeah. Can I ask a question in the, in the link behind the CNN uh, tweet here. Did did the article uh, explain things in, with much more nuance and accuracy? Some of them did. Um, some of the some of them glossed over that. Just reported the raw numbers without taking into anything. You know, digging deeper into any of it. Um, I didn't see many go as deep as Mona did into the into the race. Mm -hmm. Although you did, you do see down here. Um, in, in, in their article, particularly women of color, you know, yeah. it, it says that there. So they, they did dive deeper in this particular article. I find it, it, it seems to be sort of the, the curse of our age with social media that, um, you know, we, we, and we have to be wary of it. It's, it's what you see in the tweets or the Facebook post or on LinkedIn. It's like the, the information just condensed to the, uh, the most hyperbolic single fact they can create and what you hope is that when you click the link which unfortunately we don't all have time to do but when you click the link you can get the more detail on demand i mean it's like it's like um it's like a perverse inversion of schneiderman's uh, concept on dashboards it's like here's a detail on demand and then you can zoom out to actually get a bigger picture <laughs> yeah. uh, by by finding some detail um it seems to be the challenge uh yeah all right Anyone else want to say it? Steve, go ahead. Yeah, the, 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 so two things. One is there were some comments in chat about, hey, w what about the screaming cats? I feel like I'm, you know, the new comedian on The Tonight Show, and I've been bumped to the, uh, you know, oh, we don't have time for Steve today, so we'll be <laughs> on the next thing. I, I had volunteered for that because I knew there was awfully strong content here. But I want to give a plug for a book, not my book, or if our book or my book, but uh, this one. Um, this is the UK version, Tim Hartford, um, uh, How to Make the World Add Up. The um, US version is called The Data Detective. Um, I like this title more, but it talks about the importance of having an independent, um, uh, statistically accurate numbers like the Congressional Budget Office, and that you do not want politics to be involved with this, knowing what the numbers, knowing that they are are facts as opposed to um, politically skewed um, and and some of the absolute peril that the person who is responsible for trying to fix the economy um, the, the responsible for the statistic budget office in Greece you know receiving death threats and the like for you know for saying that well actually uh, our debt is larger than what we're reporting and the importance of having these things and being able to re rely on them uh, cannot be uh, um, I cannot underscore to a greater extent um, what people then do with that thing and skew the numbers or skew the headline about it. There's not a lot that we can do with CNN kind of doing that, but making sure that the numbers are at least things that you can trust is ridiculously important. And it's, and it's a, a truly 
good read. So uh, I recommend you get that version in the UK and the version in the US comes out February 2nd. It's a great book. Um, all right. Let us take that time to wrap up. If you were here to see the Screaming Cats and hear about turds <laughs> next month, when is the next chart chat, Steve? Can you remember? Uh, hold on. We have that in, in, in the... Uh, oh, I could, I could share my screen, shouldn't I? You can share your screen and you can get to that slide. Let's do that. Uh, top of the bill will be Steve. February the 25th, 2021, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, which I think is the same time as what we've just done today, right? Uh, so Hold join on, us Andy. there. We'll if I'm top of the bill, it means that the world is a more boring place. <laughs> and that would be just friggin' great. You know, this time last year, we were talking about Bur Boronoi tree maps, and that's what's where our greatest passion was. And wouldn't that be great? So I hope yep. um, that is absolutely the case. Absolutely. So join us there for that. But now, uh, oh, dude, I've lost this. Oh, it's, just, it's just a disaster. Today, uh, it's, it? it's, it's one of the first slides, Andy. Yeah, there there you go. go. Uh, for now, we are all going to disappear and rejoin as if by magic on the end of this URL where I'm really excited to hear what you have to say about unit charts, uh, Sankey's proportional charts, uh, and unemployment charts, and maybe even anything else that's on your mind. So is that in the chat window? Is the link in the chat window now? I'm putting it there right now. All right. Uh, while Amanda puts that into the chat window, if you are not joining us for the next half hour, thank you very much for joining. It's always great to have you with us, and I really enjoy seeing the comments in chat. Let us know what you think on Twitter or LinkedIn, and... For now, I think am I well, okay everyone's to... saying thank you. And now Amanda's <laughs> link is now scrolled up into oblivion. There you go. There Same you go. Well done. Keep yeah. pasting it. Keep pasting keep it. Keep popping and pasting that sucker in there. Yeah, all right. I gotcha. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. There you go. Yeah, okay. I'm to everyone. The next meeting. So I will see you later. In a moment. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, everybody.